Sure. Um, beyond uh, this Bridging the Gap program, what, what other work do you do? So actually currently, so I now work with um, it's the Praxis uh, Institute, which was the old Rick Hansen Institute. Uh, changed the name a few years ago. And so it's really neat. Um, so I used to work with Spinal Cord Injury of BC, which is a peer program. And I used to work at GF Strong, which is the rehab center for SCI injuries in Vancouver. And so I was working there with uh, the members, um, both that were brand new, that were new clients into GF Strong, and then also community members. And so we had Praxis came to GF Strong and did a presentation on research. Um, SCI research. And so I, I knew uh, of Praxis and, and the Institute before. And then just that one day, I was like, oh, I had a question. And I said, what do you guys do with the Indigenous community, both on and off reserve? And I sort of stumped uh, the speaker that day. He's like, oh, I don't know if we do much. And so he went back to work um, with with Praxis and and then must have chatted about it or, or talked to his, his peers or his boss. And managers and and said what do we do and and they said maybe we should do something and so they started an indigenous program and and they mainly came back to me a year or two later and said oh richard we designed a job for you we want you to come out and and help sort of um spread you know some research and and especially work within the indigenous community both on and off reserve and and so even at that time i was like oh really thank you but I don't know if I was looking for a new job, um, but then also, you know, like I said, I'm always one to accept a lot of different challenges, and and I know there's definitely, you know, a gap there too. Um, you know, to go back on the bridge and the gap, you know, <laughs> context and say, yeah, all right, we can, you know, bridge a few of those gaps also, and and especially work with, you know, just trust. That's the biggest thing now is is I always just work on with trust. <clears throat> excuse me, with um, the Indigenous community and research because that hasn't always been, you know, a great <laughs> uh, road, you know, previously in our history. And, and same thing, whether it be with the medical health field, uh, you know, with government. And, and so there's a lot of trust issues that are that are there. And you know, I could say I had that also growing up as a kid. So I know um, I just sort of want to make those, you know, that everything's a lot more... Um, I guess trustworthy nowadays that we do have even a lot of indigenous researchers that are out there, uh, indigenous healthcare workers that are trying to make it safe and secure for anybody who's just trying to find, you know, some proper healthcare for in individuals, whether it's in the major city of Vancouver or in a small town of, you know, wherever Northern BC. And so that's, you know, that should be equal and the same in both locations. And so that's one of the big things too, is to, try to make sure that we, you know, the quality of life of somebody with an SCI should be looked after first and, and make sure that, you know, their voices are heard. And so that's one big thing too. Like I said, you know, I'm not quite an advocate, but I know, I remember the situation that I went through when I was younger and sometimes I wasn't able to use my voice and, and wasn't heard. And so that's where I'm now. I can use my voice and can be heard. And it's more for a lot of those young guys or young people that are out there in the community that can't use their voice. And like I said, I remember when I was that person. So hopefully I can use my voice now so that they can be heard. And so that's one big thing that I, with work that I just wanted to get out there and sort of, like I said, bridge those gaps. That's actually a really great transition to our next question, which is what do you feel are some of the boundaries faced by disabled individuals who are trying to get into sports? Oh, that's a long list. How much time do we have? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the barriers, you know, touch, you know, let's say financial, that's always a tough one. But on, and that's on many different levels, um, financial, just buying that equipment, um, but then also financially to travel, um, financially to, you know, even just to be healthy, you know, even if you yeah, don't have proper food, you know, and even water, let's talk about getting fresh accessible water to all our our different reserves and different communities across canada you know that's you know just working on your health i mean that's the biggest thing is you know that should be taken care of before of you know many other different things um and it is like i did mention too that within most indigenous communities sport and rec is is huge and so that's one big thing is really accepting it and saying all right yes i do have a disability all right yes i do still want to get out there and enjoy sports and then location is another one that 
you know, I got very lucky that I only had to travel an hour to an hour and a half to get down to wheelchair basketball practice in Victoria. But other members might be in many, you know, more remote. And so it might be a bit tougher for them to get to different activities. And, and so, like I mentioned, um, I had to move to Vancouver if I wanted to go to that next level, whether it was a provincial team or a national team. So that was huge for me too, that, you know, I really was, you know, how old was I? I think it was about 20 or 21 when I moved to Vancouver. And I was, I was scared then too. I was like, I don't want to move away from my family. I don't want to move away from my community. You know, I have, you know, I'm a young adult and I was having a good time, but I was like, all right, if I want to go to the next level for sport, then I've got to move to Vancouver. Um, Cause that was sort of the heart. That's where a lot of the action was happening with wheelchair sports was here in Vancouver. And so that was pretty big and scary. So, you know, travel was big thin and, and then, of course, you know, we, we haven't touched on it yet, but, you know, um, racism, you know, that was huge, too. And I'd say I owe my fa- a lot of that to my family, too, and that I, you know, succeeded that, you know, when I first came over to play sports. And then, of course, I had my first major issues with um, racism and in playing wheelchair basketball. And, and you know, it's it's a surprise to, you know, that you hear that that happens. But, yes, it still happens on any sport and any different level. Um, so I went back home and I was ready to quit. I was like, all right, went back home and was chatting with one of my grandfathers. Um, and he noticed I wasn't, I was pretty down and he's like, Oh, what's the matter? And I said, yeah, I think I'm going to quit this sport then. You know, I had fun, but I don't think it's for me. And he put a great, he said, all right, yeah, you know, I respect and it, it's your choice whether you want to quit or not. And he asked why, and I told him why. And, and he sort of thought about it for a second and then came back and said, you know, do you enjoy sport? I said, yeah, I love it. I love playing wheelchair basketball. I, yeah, I really enjoy it. And, and then he sort of said, well, are you going to let that one person, that one act, take that love of the game away from me? And then that's when it really, you know, that stuck with me today. <laughs> then I'm like, all right, no, I'm not going to let those people take that sport or activity away from me. And so I said, all right. I'm going to get back out there and, and play sport. And, and, and I use that. I put that another chip on my shoulder that, all right, I'm not going to let any of that racism or any of those negative comments and, <clears throat> and, you know, knock me down. I said, no, I'm going to use that as fuel and kept me going and, and probably made me a better player, a uh, better athlete, you know, throughout my career. And, and so that's, you know, definitely another barrier. Um, and so that's where, again, I'll try to support and, and support anybody who wants to get out there and, and try a new sport or, or make it as safe and, and secure for them to get out there and, and just to enjoy themselves. Because um, that's the big thing, too, is get out there and enjoy it. If you're not going to enjoy the first time you try something, then you're probably not going to do it again. So that's why I said, all right, now let's get out there and make sure that it's enjoyable. And hopefully that they come back and try the sport again. Um, let's see, what other barriers? And even culturally, too, um, to add more, that sometimes that was tough that, like, I think I noticed that I, I just enjoyed sports and was a very good athlete. So coaches were like, oh, Richard, you should do this and train harder and, and you know, you want to be the best. But at that time, I was like, no, I don't want to be the best. I just want to have fun um, and enjoy it. And so that took me a bit to learn sort of that concept or understanding of trying to get to that next level i guess and and for me i just naturally did it on my natural abilities um and then to make the national team level i had to do a bit more and so that was um a big step to that at that time that i was sort of i guess yeah how do i say it more just a, a recreational athlete but i was good enough to make it to that next provincial or national team level and so that's one big thing, too, that that makes a huge difference with, I guess, our understanding of how we just enjoy sport. And then our, there's now the next level to excel at sport and do the best that you can be. So that was a bit of a, a learning curve for me through this early on in my career. Um, so, yeah, there's a few barriers <laughs> that I could think of. So this next one's going to be a bit of a loaded question. Um, <laughs> what is the first step in trying to break down these barriers um actually what that's what's good right now even with indigenous bridging the gap um just to get over and show that there's a lot more groups and organizations that do support sort of i don't want to say the indigenous movement or are just opportunities 
um, for athletes and, and community members, whether it be in research, in sport, and just everyday lives, that you still can get out there and enjoy it and, and be accepted. Um, you know, with Kamloops and the findings on the residential school programs that, you know, that's huge within our community and, and that's, and it's very heartbreaking and, and very tough to hear about, but it's also educational. And we got to say, all right, here, this is the truth of what did happen. And now there's got to be many different phases on how you go through it. Um, cause I think that's one of the big things that I've, you know, noticed within my career and my community that everybody still supports the positive things that I've been able to, I guess, promote and my story, you know, with me becoming, you know, a gold medalist from my community of couch and tribes. Um, so that was definitely a great story. And, and I think that's what I really enjoy now that I, I want to get out there and utilize sort of my voice and my achievements and say, here, I was able to make it from my reserve and succeed. Um, and this is how it happened. And, and so even just with social media and different programs like this, you know, thanks for having me on again. Um, but just, you know, being heard. I mean, because that's the big thing that when I grew up, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have everything in our hand on our cell phone, social media. We didn't have that information. So it's harder for me to hear about different programs. But now it's great to hear that we've got a lot of programs that are out there within sport, within the Indigenous community, um, athletes such as myself that you know, did succeed. So it's great to, you know, hear of, all right, I was able to succeed. So now there's another guy that said, okay, if Richard can do it, maybe I can do it too. So I think that's the difference nowadays that there's, <clears throat> for one, there's a lot more programs. Um, and then also acceptance of, all right, you know, not every athlete is going to go the same route as, you know, the previous athlete before me. And so maybe there's a different way to teach or way to coach. And so that's one big thing too. And, and so I always notice a lot of things that I went through and then for any new athletes that are coming up, I said, all right, I try to prepare them for what does, what is going to happen. And, and so I know a lot of those different barriers and, and obstacles that I went through. And so I can try to make it a smoother path for them or at least let them know about it too, that there's things coming up farther down the road and so on. And so, and yeah, try to make those opportunities a little more accessible. Absolutely. I'd say that's the big thing that everything's, yeah, those doors are a little more open nowadays as compared to 30, 40 years ago. But we still have a long way to go, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, that's even representing Canada and living in Canada. I hear when I travel that everybody's like, oh, Canada is a great country to live in. I said yes and no. It depends really, again, the skin of your color and or whatever status you are in, <laughs> in, in, in culture and so on. And so... I say yes and no at times. And so I've been very honored to represent Canada, but then also it's been very heartbreaking too to sorry, this is where I come from, especially being indigenous. And so that's also where I, I do try to celebrate a lot of my successes too. And say, well, here I'm, uh, you know, from Couch and Tribes and this is where I've succeeded and, and had success. And so, and let's share those moments and, and, and enjoy those. And, and, um, and then, yeah, I mean, we can always talk about, you know, residential schools and issues that are arising and continuing. Those numbers are getting bigger and bigger. And and so it sometimes it's good to sit back and go, hold on here. Here's a good story, too. Let's talk about some of those good stories and not a lot of those negative stories. And, and so that's always a very tough. But but, you know, both have to be shared and educated on. Absolutely. Um do you feel that disabled athletes are stigmatized? And if so, how? It's, it's very tough. Even let's, let's take the word inspiring, you know, and, and that's always, you know, I could say, yes, I'm inspirational to some people and, and even people within the SCI community or not just SCI, but disabled community, you know, sometimes when we do normal everyday activities, whether we're doing our laundry or going to the bank or, you know, doing some shopping, um, somebody might come up and go, oh, wow, you're an inspiration. You know, it's great what you're doing. And I'm like, I'm just doing the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, but that's what I talk, even I argue with my peers and my community members like, oh yeah, we're not inspirational. We're just doing what we're doing. And, 
But then I was, I will come back and say, well, yes, we're not inspiration to one another because we're still just doing our sport, doing what we love, doing everyday activity. But then to somebody else who might never have seen somebody with a, uh, a disability get out there into the community or, or do their own laundry or, you know, do everyday activities or do sport at a high level, then I'd say, yes, that could be an inspiration to them because they've never seen that. Um, so yes and no. And there's always different, you know, concepts and, and that's, you know, that's another barrier that we could talk about with, you know, breaking down those stigma, stigmatations and, and so on, because it's, that's one of the big things that I'll, I've always fought with. And that's why I like to talk about my story. And, and cause I, you know, one good story was, um, when I was very young, I'll say I was 10 or 11, uh, going through my mall and, you know, shopping with my friends and family and just cruise around the mall. And then one young kid and a mother came walking by me and, and the young kid who probably was four or five years old, was like, Oh, look, mommy, somebody in a wheelchair. Um, why is that? But then the mother either was busy or who knows what, but didn't have time and, and sort of shielded the child from me and said, Oh, no, nope, don't look at that. Or don't talk about that. Um, so I took that very to heart right away. And I was like, Oh, wow. I was like, so from that day on, I was like, no, I don't want to be closed or I don't want to be, you know, shield. If somebody has a question, I'm going to be open and, and hopefully I can answer that question and, and educate those people. And, and so that's where I'm always happy to get out there and, you know, share my story like today or whether I go to schools and talk to a school or go to different communities and, and share my stories and, and just say right, that, yeah, you can't be scared to talk to somebody with a disability or, or somebody, you know, that's out doing everyday stuff. Like I, same thing. I've been to a restaurant with somebody who was probably walking beside me. And then the staff would always talk to the person that was standing because to their education, they're like, Oh, this person has a disability. They probably can't talk for themselves or they can't, who knows if they can verbalize whatever they got. And so they directly automatically go to talk to the able-bodied person. And so whenever that happens or, or before it happens, if I go into a restaurant, then I always open that door first. I'm like, oh, hi, you know, say hi to the waiter or waitress and say, oh, hi, John or, or Julie. Like, hi, could we get a few drinks to start? And then we'll get the menus and go on from there. And so then to open that door to start communicating with one another uh, before the other issue does happen. And so, you know, those there's always those small barriers that are continuing. And so. Like I said, you know, I'd never really thought of myself as, as a public speaker or a role model or, or advocate, but I will always fight, you know, and, and educate. Mainly that's the big thing. I won't say fight, <laughs> but it's educate, you know, whether it's somebody individually or, or somebody, you know, or, or a larger community and school and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, even with Rick Hansen, you know, with him wheeling around the world, that just opened a lot of eyes, not just within Canada, but globally. And said, all right, here, that's the movement, you know, that would go with research and, and also just really say, right, here, this is possible and this is doable. Um, so that's one big thing that, that that's what's changed uh, sort of the movement within um, awareness and education and, and right, just, again, anything is possible, which is that old popular saying. And so that's uh, always a possibility of what can happen. Just out of curiosity, why don't you consider yourself an advocate? Because from my position, like just seeing all the work that you've done, I, I, I think you're more than qualified. Probably again, just when I talk about as being an athlete, I'm like, no, I don't think of myself as a high performance athlete. I just enjoy sports. I just enjoy it because what I'm doing. And, and so the same thing that with as being an advocate, I'm like, no, I'm not a role model. But now I know to utilize my voice that, all right, yes, I am. Um, even within, I'm sure if you talk to any of the people that I've worked with, they're like, oh, you know, I, I rarely talk about myself. I'm like, all right, here, this is some opportunities that you can do. And this is what you can and happen. And, and so I was just trying to introduce or educate all on those lines. So that's where I don't think like, yeah, I'm not going to talk about myself, but I'm going to talk about other programs that are out there and opportunities and, and, and like VAMS. You know, yeah, get out there and, and learn about how to play, you know, any kind of equipment or, or use your voice and become, you know, put down that first track 
Um, I think that's a great program for, you know, anybody with a disability and, and just get out there and try that again, because there's so many different barriers that shut those doors for you. And so it's great now to have those doors opened again and just even promotion. Like that's where I, you know, I always say I'm a great middleman that, you know, whether that's either you call myself an advocate or a middleman and that, you know, if somebody comes up and has a question, then I'm like, oh, yeah, you want to try sports? Go talk to wheelchair sports. You want to find out about music? Go talk to vans. You want to find about how to drive again? Go this direction. And and so I always try to point somebody in the right direction. And and um, I, I maybe I shouldn't have said, yes, I'm not an advocate because I know I am. When I was younger, I'm like, no, I'm not a role model. I'm not an advocate. But yeah, yes, I know I do. And, um, but yeah, I'd say still, I'm just, you know, Richard here trying to help you and point you in the right direction. <laughs> Is there anything you've learned about yourself or maybe about society as a whole from your experience? Again, that's another loaded question, eh? <laughs> um, <laughs> even, even with my wife, who's also a Paralympic athlete and, and has gone through a lot of different, probably the same path that I've gone on. Um, but then even when I tell her more about what I've gone through as a child and, and with life, and she's like, she, she does sometimes sit down and she's like, how did you survive? And I think that's one of the big things too. That's, you know, one thing that I think about that, you know, she could say, Aaron, how did I survive? And also I can say, well, this is my life. This is what I was given. You know, yes, it's definitely not the best card that you know, I, I could best hand that I could have been playing with. Um, but, you know, it's like that old saying of, you know, when you're given lemons, you make lemonade. Um, so I, I definitely had a lot of those different challenges. And, and so I think that's where, you know, I just still just lived and thrived and, and moved on from there. And it's, it's yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's always a tough question. It's, you know, I always just notice, all right, well, this is the way I've gone. And, and that's always been my train of thought, too, with you know, maybe it's great that I did have my injury as a young child and I could see all of those different challenges every day from opening a door to, you know, curb cuts. They didn't have many curb cuts back in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, even going to the dentist, I didn't like going to the dentist, not because I didn't like the dentist, but it was because it was up a flight of stairs and there was no elevator back back in my home community at, to go see that dentist. And so I had to crawl up the stairs to go see the dentist and so that was definitely a challenge as a kid and so yeah there's definitely always been a lot of different um, challenges and barriers and and i think that's always been sort of my mindset too that all right uh, you know whether i've always been positive or, or always you know i always look at the, the positive things in life and and not necessarily if i'm going to sit back and dwell on the negative things well that's going to be a long road also, <laughs> you know, that's never easy for anybody. And so that's one of the big things, all right. Yes. Even with, especially with COVID right now, we can sit here and, and talk about how negative and how bad things are right now. It's like, well, hold on, let's just sit back and enjoy the small things too, that we can enjoy. And, and, you know, great that we can work from home and you know, sometimes we'll find out whether we're good or bad at working at home, <laughs> which is 50, 50 for me. Um, but yeah, so there's definitely, I think that's one big thing that I've always looked at the positives in a lot of the situations. And I always see that there's two paths that whatever issue does come up in your life and you have a choice to either go up to the high road or go down to the low road. And, and so we've always got two choices with any situation that does come. And, and so it's still your choice to make that decision. And um, hopefully you learn from it or, or hopefully, you know, whether it's a good or bad choice and, and still learn from it and, and move on and use that for the next situation. What's next for you? <laughs> hopefully retirement on some sunny beach somewhere <laughs> um yeah no it's just a bit more of, of i guess all of the above being that advocate and educator and, and just trying to you know i always do say that i got very lucky for you know me ended up where i am here today so that's where i, I want to make sure that those doors are open for somebody else that's coming down that road and saying you know that there might be a few challenges and obstacles and say well Yes, there are, but there's also solutions to that situation. And, and so, yeah, I'm just trying to help that next, I guess, little Richard that's coming up, up the road and, and give them also those opportunities and, and open those doors for them too. And that perfectly transitions into our last question. Um, is there anything that you would like to tell our listeners, perhaps a young individual with a disability aspiring to be 
um, a, a Paralympian or even just uh, interested in trying out a sport? Not even to think about being a Paralympian. Just get out there and do what you enjoy. Um, for me, you know, my wife and family always talk about that. I'm, I'll still be a young kid and get out there and enjoy and have a lot of fun with whatever I'm doing. And I'm like, yeah, but that's what I enjoy. Um, so for sports, I love doing any kind of sports. Like right now, I'm doing hand cycling. I'm doing badminton. I'm, you know, I'll say I do a bit of swimming. It's more just floating. But um, yeah, I always try to get out there and enjoy any activity that I can. And um, that's because I enjoyed and love doing sports. Um, so that's what I would say, like, right, whether it's, you know, before your SCI injury or, or, our health condition, then, you know, if you did a sport or activity before it, then well, let's get out and try it again. There's in a way that it can be adapted. Um, and you still can partake in that same sport or we can direct you towards another sport. So mainly to get out there and enjoy yourselves. Um, so that's one of the big things. And, and, you know, it'd be great if one day that you get out there and enjoy that sport or activity and that it can lead you towards uh, being a Paralympic athlete or represent Canada, represent your community, um, then yeah, that's another added bonus, but just to make sure you get out there and have fun and enjoy it. Absolutely. Richard, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a very insightful conversation. Well, thanks, Sean, for having me and uh, good luck with, with everything you're doing today too. Thank you. This is uh, Sean Burdett with uh, Reimagine Radio. You guys have yourself a good night tonight.